When we talk about vaccinations, what diseases are covered in our routine vaccinations for our pets? So before we go into the testing, I feel it's a good reminder for all of us to find out, number one, why are we vaccinating in the first place? Okay, so what diseases are we um, doing for, for our vaccinations in our pets anyway? And this is where it gets tricky. I'm trying not to give a very bland presentation whereby you're just memorizing diseases, which you can Google it anyway. So I have tried a method to try to allow you to remember these diseases a little bit better. So without further ado, let's meet the disaster family. We've got discontented Dylan, horrific Hitler, persistent Pam, Larry Lou, and crazy Colin. You must be thinking, I'm gone mad. What on earth is all these different names for? Let's find out. So let's talk about discontented Dylan. So imagine a dissatisfied boxer who keeps punching despite colds and flu and being sick. We're talking about canine distemper. Discontented Dylan distemper. So it's a virus similar to the measles virus. It's passed from inhalation from close contact from infected dogs. The symptoms may include things like runny nose and eyes, coughing and vomiting, like a cold, like a flu. Uh, nervous signs may develop with hardening of the foot pads where the discontented boxer just keeps punching. Usually fatal, unfortunately. There isn't much of a cure for it, uh, prevented by regular vaccination. In UK, there are still several outbreaks annually, so it's not totally eradicated from UK yet. What about horrific Hitler? Imagine prisoners of war, concentration camps with poor conditions. I know, I know it's a little bit controversial, but uh, please bear with me. So we're talking about infectious canine hepatitis. Hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. And uh, it's an adenovirus transmitted by close doctor dog contact. The symptoms are usually very high temperature, abdominal discomfort, no appetite, vomiting and diarrhea, developing into jaundice. Um, jaundice means uh, the skin is turning yellow. It's usually fatal as well. Any sort of surviving dogs usually have blue eyes, as you can see in the picture over there. It's uh, usually prevented by regular vaccination. Uh, there isn't really, really a sort of a treatment for it. It's all supportive as well. What about persistent Pam? Keep sticking around, won't give up. Okay, and we are talking about the canine parvovirus. It is a virus, it's a very, very hardy environmental virus, usually spread from feces of infected dogs. It is a bit of a pain in the backside because it is infectious, it does stick around the environment for a very, very long time. It is a nightmare trying to bleach um, the place uh, if there is a if there is a sort of a case at a hospital, uh, trying to bleach the place. It's, um, yeah, so it is a very, very hardy uh, sort of a virus. That's why we're talking about persistent pain. And the symptoms are pretty dramatic. They can be quite depressed, they're quite lethargic. They get severe bloody diarrhea as well. They can also get vomiting, abdominal pain, and dehydration. The dehydration comes from the severe bloody diarrhea and vomiting. They keep losing so much fluid that they don't drink enough to replenish the fluid loss, and hence they get a dehydration. This is usually fatal due to dehydration and secondary bacterial infection. The whole immune system crashes. So secondary bacterial infections, opportunistic, uh, opportunistic bacteria, which usually do not cause a problem, comes out and play. They proliferate and causes a problem. It's also prevented by regular vaccination. So this, this sort of a condition, occasionally they can be treated and managed by some, a lot, a lot of supportive treatment, a lot, a lot of fluid uh, replenishment because of the increased fluid loss. Um, a lot of different antibiotics. Uh, usually we go for a three triple combination antibiotics just because we want to cover all the spectrum. So it can be a bit of a, uh, it, it sort of can be treated, but you know, the success rate isn't great. We sometimes also use things like interferon, uh, uh, like a virus, um, uh, antivirus medication, and all this all can be quite expensive. So it's not unusual for these patients, if we do treat them, to stay in hospital, you know, a few days to a week, or even 10 days to two weeks, depending on how the patient is getting on. And it can certainly cause a lot of issue because apart from being in isolation, cost-wise can be quite, uh, 
um, substantial as well, uh, potentially running to the thousands of pounds, uh, which um, may not be afforded by, by all owners. So vaccination is certainly a good way of um, reducing the risk or actually eliminating the risk of this happening. And in UK, there are still parvo outbreaks from time to time. Larry Lou. So this is a guy who has got poor toilet hygiene. Okay, Smelly Larry is a nickname. What do we mean by that? Leptospirosis. Okay, so it is a bacteria, so that's the difference. It is not a virus. The first three diseases, the first three conditions we discuss, distemper, hepatitis, and parvo, they're all viruses. Whereas leptospirosis is a bacteria. The significance comes back to that in a bit in, uh, when I'm going through something else. So right now, it's a bacteria. It spreads from infected urine of other dogs or infected rats. Stagnant water is a common co uh, common source or common cause. So f usually for sort of dogs who are living say on farms and they get sort of stagnant water and it's rats as well, they are a little bit much of a higher risk. It is also zoonosis, which means that it can be spread to humans. The symptoms can be quite variable, often affects the liver or the kidneys, also in humans as well. So you gotta be quite careful with those really. It's usually unfortunately fatal as well, and it's usually prevented with annual vaccination. So same thing, it is another condition that is uh, it's not a very nice condition and uh, they, it, we usually sort of vaccinate against it so that we don't get it in the first place because it can be a bit of a nightmare to treat. So leptospirosis, we tend to talk about two different sort of lepto, lepto 2 and lepto 4. As you can see from this uh, little pie chart, we have got a lot of different strains of lepto actually. So when you talk about lepto 2, that's a traditional strain that we us usually have is a canicola, the one in blue and the one in green, Copenhagen. Um, and uh, these two strains are found in the vaccine lepto 2, which is why it's called L2. L4 fundamentally means there are four strains involved because it also includes um, icterohemorrhage and also Bratislavia. Um, and they do have a bit of cross protection, but um, not all of it. So Lepto 4 is another vaccine that has got four Lepto strains in it, hence called Lepto 4. So usually, usually in UK, uh, certainly Lepto 2 is still quite prevalent, um, whereas the other two is much rarer in UK. It is a little more uh, prevalent in Europe, which is why dogs going to Europe certainly would be uh, highly recommended to have Lepto 4 vaccines compared to Lepto 2 because of the two extra strains over there. Let's talk about Crazy Colin. So, Crazy Colin is persistent. He's annoying. He goes around and makes a lot of noise. What are we talking about? We're talking about kennel cough, okay, or for the more technical name or the more uh, accurate name, okay, it's infectious tracheobronchitis. So basically it just means that it's infectious. It has, uh, it has, it causes inflammation in the, uh, in the tracheal and the bronchus, which is the airways. It's a multifactorial disease. It's not just one particular uh, bacteria or one particular virus. It usually involves Bordetella, septica, canine parainfluenza virus, um, sometimes canine adenovirus, and also other little sort of uh, organisms like mycoplasma, canine uh, herpes virus, real virus, but these are not as common. So the most commonly isolated agents causing kennel cough. Bordetella, septica is the most frequently isolated. This particular bacteria can survive in water for up to nine days. Uh, so think about communal water bottles that you find in parks, in other places, um, in pubs. Uh, clinical signs can occur three to four days post exposure. If uncomplicated, tend to last for about 10 days. But dogs, they can shed bacteria for six to 14 weeks. So as you can see, this is a bit of a nightmare really because the advice to uh, owners is tricky because you can't really advise, you know, your dog shouldn't be seeing other dogs for 6 to 14 weeks. That is uh, almost uh, unheard of. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see how it can spread fairly easily because not a dog with kennel cough potentially will not be isolated for 6 to 14 weeks uh, just in case uh, they shed bacteria, which means they just walk around and keep shedding bacteria anyway. So this also brings me to the next point of uh, calling kennel cough is a bit of a misnomer uh, because you don't really get it in kennels, you fundamentally get it from any nose-to-nose -nose contact with any strange dogs in the park. 
Canine parainfluenza virus is the second most commonly isolated infectious agent. If uncomplicated, mild upper respiratory signs only, the more protracted and severe disease happens when border teller is involved as well. So you have this virus that is depressing the immune system, allowing border teller to cause even more issues. Together, they cause more issues than having uh, than animal contracting each one only. So it is a highly contagious trichobronchitis aerosol spread which means they share the same airspace okay so people will say that they've isolated the dogs with a fence doesn't really work that way unfortunately the most common in multi-dog environments like kennels rescue shelters um, in shows pet stores grooming salons uh, vet hospitals um, the signs they can be uh, a fairly dry hacking cough usually the owner sounds as though it is uh, the owner describes like it's a retching or a bone stuck in the throat like <coughs> Sort of thing. Um, excuse my acting, but there we go. Usually there's no fever or loss of appetite. Um, it is only usually very, very severe in very, very young or very, very old animals or if there's other implications or complications for that depresses the immune system for whatever reason. The science can last for days to weeks, so it really, really depends. Okay, And that is where it reflects onto the treatment. Whether we, how, how much we treat usually is how uh, how severe the particular case is. Um, as we discussed, it usually can just disappear on its own over time without any treatment, but sometimes it can be quite severe. It can be quite nasty, you know, for the both for the animal and for the owner to hear the dog hackingly cough um, and can't really uh, relax or eat properly and things like that and causing that tremendous sound, uh, tremendous noise. So it is not uncommon. Sometimes we do treat it by giving a short dose of anti-inflammatories, um, potentially even antibiotics, although the evidence backing that up is very, very minimal. So treatment versus vaccination against for kennel cough. So treatment is possible using antibiotics and anti-inflammatories as we discussed, pre but prevention with the annual intranasal vaccine is preferable. So even in the data sheet, they say that it doesn't totally eliminate the risk of kennel cough. Potentially, it just reduces the severity and intensity of the and the duration of the condition itself. So there are some animals who are vaccinated against kennel cough. They still get kennel cough, but the signs are not as severe compared to when they are not vaccinated. So which dogs should we vaccinate? Do we only vaccinate dogs going to the kennels? Not really. Any socialized dogs is at risk of contracting kennel cough and is not only seen in kennel dogs. As I mentioned, it is just any sort of, if your dog has, is exposed to other dogs like in a park and things like that, um, they're at risk of kennel cough, not just if they're going to the kennels. It's highly recommended for puppies being socialized and participating in training classes.